Actually, what I'd really like to do is introduce you to uh, Jonathan Ryan, the executive director of RAISIS, to give us a further uh, situation update. I feel like RAISIS is the sort of um, one of the most on the ground folks with the update uh, with the updates about the kids and then when we have a report in from the various representatives those of you who are working with families and kids uh, hopefully we'll streamline that in a way that if you're uh, responding in um, a way that's different from someone else that you would report in so I hope that uh, the things that Jonathan will say will then dovetail into the representatives from the agencies, especially the, the governmental representatives and the larger organizations um, will respond to some of the, especially long-term issues. So Jonathan, please um, help us see the whole picture and help us understand uh, what we can do to help. Great, thank you. I think I'm already, mic I'm hot. All right, great. Hi, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for coming out. Can you hear me okay? I can hear myself really well. Okay, that's weird. Um, so my name is Jonathan Ryan, and I'm, a, I'm an attorney, but as we say in the uh, Wizard of Oz, I'm a good attorney. Um, and um, I, uh, I really appreciate that graph that you were just showing, because that, that kind of shows... Uh, I, I've also got a, another guest from RAESIS here, Helena Ryan who is the new uh, uh, interfaith outreach coordinator for RAESIS, and she's also seated in the mother's section because I've got my mom here helping me as well. And so uh, I'm, I, I was glad to see that chart because I, I kind of told my mom, I was like, now you see why I've been so busy. Um, in two th uh, so RAESIS is the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. We are a non-governmental, non-for-profit agency that has been here in San Antonio since 1986. Our work predates that uh, incorporation. Some of the founding members of RAESIS are here with us today. It began essentially during the Central American Wars by a group of people who were assisting those who were coming directly across the border, still bearing the wounds, still hungry, still tired from the journey, and they provided them that basic assistance. Some of those members went to federal prison because of the work that they did on behalf of those people. Uh, as laws changed and the, the focus of RAESIS became legal services, we've developed into essentially a law firm. We are a law office that assists ref, uh, underserved refugees, children, and families in Central and South Texas. We have an office here in San Antonio that's at Flores and Poplar. If you know M.K. Davis or the Michoacana there on Flores, we're right across the street. We also have a location up at 410 and 35 next to the immigration offices, and we have new offices in Corpus Christi and Austin. Most of this is due to the rise in the number of unaccompanied children here in our region. When I, went to, when I came to RAESIS in 2008, we were an agency of four people. Uh, today we are an agency of 40. Uh, we'll probably be an agency of 50 or 60 by the end of the year. And the growth has been due to the rise in the number of unaccompanied children here. Uh, in 2008, I answered the phone, and it was a request from a non-for-profit in New York that administers funding for legal services for unaccompanied children, asking if I could provide Know Your Rights presentations and basic legal screenings to just 28 children who are in San Antonio. That's what they told me. Just 28 children. It won't be hard. That was in 2008. In 2009, there were 60 kids. In 2010, there were 120. In 2011, there were 250. In 2012, there were 500. Last year, in 2013, it got up to 1,000 children, and we thought, ah, that's as nuts where it's going to stop. And this year, we were providing at our max in mid-July, we were providing services to over 2,300 children here in the San Antonio and Corpus Christi area. So the agency that I, I work with, RAESIS, that I run, uh, provides classes, Know Your Rights presentations to these children very soon after they arrive at the Health and Human Service facilities. During these presentations, we explain to them what their rights are and what their responsibilities are to the immigration court. Because it looks many ways like a child protective services environment, except differently from that context where the parents are maybe the subject of a criminal prosecution. In this case, it's the children who have to respond to a court. And there is no appointed counsel in the immigration system because it's considered civil in manner, not criminal. There is no appointed counsel. Despite the fact that we have changed the immigration courts by law over the recent years to more resemble a court, a criminal court, and the consequences of deportation, as we know, can be as severe as death. So we try to fill that gap 
left by the absence of a public defender model. And we provide the children information, and for many children we provide them free representation, or we attempt to match them with a pro bono in the area where they're going to reunify to. So that, that's the work that we do, and the work has grown significantly over the past several years, obviously. Now when the crisis hit or the influx came this summer, we were not provided as usual additional funding to serve Lackland. And we saw a lot of parts of the country where no services were provided to these large Department of Defense facilities. We made a decision, I say we on behalf of my staff, they love it when I say that. We made a decision that we were going to go to Lackland even though we didn't have funding. And so starting on June 9th, we uh, requested access to Health and Human Services to provide services at Lackland. And we began to provide Know Your Rights and individual screenings. We completed providing initial legal screenings to all of the children at Lackland last Wednesday. So in just less than 60 days, we provided individual consultations to over 1,650 children. We found after those, those screenings, we have a multi-page intake screening that we've developed over the past six years to collect information that can help us identify children who may be refugees. They may be in fear of persecution or may have indeed been persecuted in their home country. They may be victims of extreme forms of abuse, abandonment, neglect, or other crimes under our state laws, but in their home countries. They may be victims of human trafficking. They may also be victims of a crime that occurred in or has some nexus to the United States. So we're screening the children for factual information that we can then use to determine if they're eligible for this form of relief from deportation. They can successfully defend their deportation and remain here permanently in the United States with a humanitarian protection. We have found that 63% of the children with whom we have worked are eligible, are likely to succeed in their cases before an immigration court. This finding flies in the face of the statements by the administration, by immigration, by others who claim that these children are not refugees, are not eligible for any form of relief, and will ultimately be deported home. It's just factually not true. Unfortunately, many immigrants and many children do not have representation. And as a, as a child, a six-year-old child trying to prepare an asylum application, I know many lawyers, we have to handhold them through the pro bono process a few times before they understand how to put together an asylum application. The children have literally no hope, no hope of preparing this request. And that lack of wherewithal often leads to them being ultimately ordered removed. It has nothing to do with their eligibility or what's happened to them. It's that they have no voice. These children have no lobbyists. They've got no voice in this process. They've got no voice in our politics, except for potentially us. And thanks to our access, we're able to meet with these children, and we hope to be able to provide them with some sort of voice in this process. So what, um, what I think that we can do today, and I'd like to quickly get this into a question and answer kind of a format, because I think that'll drive the discussion a bit better. Um, what I can provide, I think, to this group is that we've been, we've been inside this system, so to speak. The, the, the statute, the laws that protect these children that are currently being discussed as being changed um, require that the shelters, that Health and Human Service provide access to counsel. So through this statute, agencies like RAISIS can enter into the Health and Human Service facilities. We can gain access to these children to learn their stories, who they are, and really most importantly, where are they going? Because of all the children in this, in this system, so we have this pre-existing system, right? Lackland got us into the news and it made us all aware of it. We have, an, we have a system that's been here for years, and it's managed by organizations like BCFS, Baptist Child and Family Service, like the Archdiocese, Southwest Key, International Educational Solutions. These are non-for-profits that have contracts with Health and Human Services to provide shelter space. Normally, it is a home-like or group home-like setting where these children reside. Due to the influx, Lackland popped up in order to be a clearinghouse for children because there was no room in the existing in the existing system. Right? At this point now, they've increased capacity around the country. So they, they created these three Air Force or military bases that had approximately 1,000 children in each facility for a total of 3,000 children. Well, what they've done over the summer is they've, they've opened up approximately more or less 10 facilities around the country with about 300 beds in each. That replaces that 3,000 military bases with 3,000 beds of smaller, more appropriate for child setting shelter beds. 
So these children are moving through now out of Lackland. No new kids are coming to Lackland. They're moving out to the classic shelters, as we call them, more appropriate long-term settings, and they're being reunified with family members. So of all of these children who are in these shelters, we talk about 1,200 kids at Lackland. It's important to keep in mind not just the number, but the pace, the movement. Movement is key to this whole system, and I think as we respond, we have to understand that these are moving populations. They're, the, the migration continues even after they've crossed the border. Okay? So these children are spending between 14 and 30 days in these facilities. So the 1,200 kids at Lackland today are not the same 1,200 kids that were there two weeks ago. They're moving. Approximately 90 to 96, I've heard, percent of the children who are in these HHS facilities reunify to a family member or a sponsor. Now, when we talk about family reunification, it is not always the case that these children are moving to my favorite Uncle Tony, okay? They're often going to the, 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 the step-cousin of my, my second aunt, people that they've never met before, in fact. They're, they're family members, but they're very distant family members. So this is not, it is not true that all of these children are simply coming to reunify with mom and dad. I wish it was the case, but it's not. So most of these children re will reunify with family members. Of those 96% of the kids who will reunify, so taking 90,000, let's say 100,000 children come this year to make the math a little easier, we can say 96,000 children are gonna reunify with family members. Of those 96,000, 86% of them are gonna leave the state of Texas. Here in Texas, we get 14% of the reunified unaccompanied children. We are the number one state for reunification. No other state gets 14%. But it's true that the majority of children are going to leave the state. And so a big consideration that we have is matching children with pro bono attorneys out in the four corners of the nation. They're going to Florida, California, New York, Virginia, and oh boy, Georgia. Get ready. Woo! They're about to hit Georgia. We're finding children are going to states that had previously passed these SB 1070-like laws that forced the existing undocumented but long-term integrated into the community undocumented individuals were forced out and now we're seeing children going into these agricultural areas potentially to replace that workforce so many of these children have been trafficked many of these children will be trafficked and a big part of what we do when we get into the facilities is we try to inoculate them we try to inform them about trafficking we try to enable them with phone numbers hotlines 911 how to make a cry how to how to ask for help that it's okay to ask for help. We have to tell girls that they don't need to provide sex to the people that they're living with in exchange for being residents. Very, very vulnerable, these children, once they get out. So there's a big part of this, big focus is at the border, I know, and that's definitely, there's a lot of need. Um, we've seen it at Greyhound stations. And there's a great need for that as people have been released. Now they're gonna be detaining the families, so the need is gonna shift uh, as the families are not being dumped off at Greyhound but are gonna be detained. So there's going to be a great need for legal services and reception services as those who are released on bond are dropped off at our Greyhound station here. That's a very, very weak point. Every night, about 11 o'clock, the private detention buses come by and just drop people off at the cargo drop-off over at the Greyhound station at Pecan and St. Mary's. I, I was there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning once picking up a lady, and there was uh, at least four Central American women with seven or eight children just huddled in the corner. I was there at 2.30 in the morning. I was there wearing my suit, and they looked deathly afraid of me, I, 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 as if I was some kind of a, you know, um, immigration guy there to, 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 to mess with them. So um, there's a great need for those who are released. A big focus has been on these shelters and the detention systems, but people are very vulnerable when they're released. The kids who are reunified are released. There are kids who are reunified into our area. So I think since, this, since October, approximately 400 children have reunified into the San Antonio district. Now the San Antonio district is huge. This is Waco, Corpus, uh, Laredo, Eagle Pass, Del Rio, San Angelo. It's a huge district, that immigration court district for San Antonio. So the children are spread along, are along a wide geographic area. But they're clearly gonna be hitting our schools very soon. I think that that's another thing that we need to be prepared for. They, they're gonna need special services. They're gonna need access to information about how they can uh, guide their cases. The, the children who age out, at the age of 18, children are normally kicked uh, ICE shows up to the kids' shelter and brings them to the detention center. Over our years of work, we've, we've worked very closely in a stakeholder way with ICE. We've managed to successfully get children released on their 18th birthday instead of getting sent to adult detention, which is a wonderful thing, except for the fact that we now have a person on our hands. We've just created a homeless person, right, at the very worst. 
And so we work with other organizations. Uh, Father Phil Lay is not here, but um, Posada Guadalupe is a home on the west side where um, the, he receives a lot of these young adults now as we're waiting for their immigration paperwork to get complete. So there's a real need for community response around the children who are leaving the foster care system, much like in the domestic context. But these kids are less culturally aware, less equipped to be able to be self-reliant when they get here. So that's a huge community response that's very ne needed. We also have here 78, 74 beds of long-term foster care through the Baptist Child and Family Service Center. These are children who have been through the shelter system, tried to reunify, and there's been nobody. These are children who are ser 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 alone in this country. And they are represented and pursuing a case, some kind of a refugee benefit, and they're then therefore placed into foster homes and also a group home that's uh, on the campus. These children are in our communities. They're going to John Jay uh, High School normally. Um, they're on the soccer team. You should see the trophies at the group home. We're killing it. We've definitely, we've definitely raised the, the sport, the beautiful game here in San Antonio over the last few years. Um, and so the, 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 this is a process. Um, there are organizations and individuals who have been involved in this for years. So this is not completely new to, to, to us. The numbers are, are great. The numbers are new. And we're seeing within those numbers there are changes. We're starting to begin to parse through our data in more refined ways to discover, for example, that although Honduras has been the number one country, Guatemala is the number one country that we've seen in Lackland. Um, we've seen an increase in indigenous people who are fleeing. We've seen increases in more younger children. And we've seen increases in, in, in girls. Now, one thing that we talk about in, in our business is, is, is filter rates. And that is the, you compare the number of people who are reported to be leaving the countries compared to those who are arriving. And though we're seeing larger numbers of girls, the filter rates show that more girls are leaving Honduras and El Salvador than are getting here, much more. Many, many of them are not making it. Relative to those two countries, Guatemalan girls are getting here more in greater numbers compared to those who leave. And some of the information, we're just start, fresh information we're starting to get from our qualitative and quantitative intakes uh, from, from Lackland. And as we look at the reasons, just to speak a little bit about these people and some of the trends that we're seeing, is, is that the flight of girls from Honduras and El Salvador is much more solitary. And that the Guatemalans, it's tied to the fact that we're seeing more indigenous people. We're seeing more non-Spanish speakers. Mam, Che, Quiche, Aguacateca, Cachquel, Ichquel. All these new words that we're learning of children who are coming as indigenous groups. You see images of the children riding on the trains. And literally with the Guatemalans, they're traveling in groups. They're family tied. Because they're indigenous, they're more closely related by culture and language and family bonds than the more urban Hondurans and El Salvadorans who are fleeing alone. And they, 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 arrive, they, they, they gather together in groups en route out of necessity. But the Guatemalans are leaving in groups. And what you see in the images is literally you see the boys surrounding the girls, protecting them as they go forward. And, and this helps the girls to arrive more intact and, and more safe. But, but we're hearing just atrocious things, and, and I, I could unfortunately speak on and on and on about the stories that we hear of the children, things that they fled, things that they've suffered en route. And unfortunately, many children these days are expressing that the worst thing that happened to them in the entire trip was being arrested by Border Patrol and being put in what we call the hielera, or the ice box. And these are Border Patrol stations, but they're also container boxes that are spread out around uh, the border area where people are put as they're being processed into HHS. Um, the law requires that uh, the, for the Border Patrol has 48 hours to determine if a child is an unaccompanied minor. After that, they have 72 hours to get the child out of their custody and into the custody of Health and Human Services. The children do not need to be in the custody of their prosecutor. Duh. Took litigation to figure that out. Well, <clears throat> so they have five days to get them out. During this time, they're often kept in cells or boxes where they eat, they sleep, they use the restroom. They're kept there oftentimes with adults because they haven't yet determined that they're children. <laughs> they got 48 hours and they use them. The mandated time is five days. That's what the law allows. In fact, we're seeing that the average length of stay from the children we've met with is seven days. This is seven days in a box eating two bologna sandwiches a day in about 55 to 60 degree temperatures. It's extremely cold in these areas. Um, the average stay is seven days. We've heard children reporting up to 12. We've heard children talking about their concern for other children who had 
lost consciousness due to the cold. Uh, it's devastating to hear a child expressing concern about another child. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a devastating situation to be in. Um, so uh, uh, I, we really need a community response. I must say that organizations like RIASIS have felt kind of out there on our own for many years. Uh, you can read my grant requests. I've got so many foundations that are coming asking me now how they can help, and I've been saying, well, go read the grant requests I've been putting in for the last few years. We've been, we've been the miner's canary on this issue for years. We've seen it, we've seen it doubling in our own context. We've been kind of, uh, I, I think we've had a, a realization, those of us who are involved in this work, as the rest of the world has taken a look at this and, and reeled in shock, we're standing back and looking and realizing what we've been through. I'm having to get counselors for my staff at this point, after what they've been through this summer, the associated trauma that, that, that prepare, prepare yourselves for uh, uh, will, will be an issue if you really get involved with this. And I, I just want to close and get to question and answer. Important questions. Uh, uh, why are you here, little kid? All right. If you ask these children, why are they here? Why did they come to the United States? I will guarantee you the answer you will hear from every child. I came here to study and to get a job and to support my family. That's what they'll tell you to a T. Why? Because you're asking this child, why are you on my doorstep, little kid? What do you want from me? You're stoking their shame, you're stoking their guilt. They're going to tell you what they think that they want you to hear. I'm here to be a good person. I'm here to contribute and I'm not here to take. That's what they'll tell you. And it's true. Ask that same child, why did you have to leave your house? Why could you not live in your hometown anymore? And you will hear a different story. You will hear the truth. Mm -hmm. Because all these children that we see, it's like the trunk of a tree. They've all kind of arrived here at our border, and they're kind of this monolithic group. They all look the same. They've got the same story. They're all here. You follow those stories up like a tree, and you'll see that they branch out to these tiny little branches, and that's when you get to the kid. That's when you get to the beginning of these stories. That's a child who's alone, who somebody is hurting that child. Somebody is not protecting that child. And it has to do with this overwhelming lid of crime and organized violence, normalized violence, that sits like a lid on top of these three countries, the Northern Triangle. These children see the world through the lens of their families. That's how children see the world. They see somebody in their house, maybe an uncle, maybe a parent, maybe a step-parent, who's harming them, who's maybe exploiting them. That person, that adult, is usually bearing the pressure of the gangs that the child may see or may not see. They're involved with the gangs. They're being recruited. They're resisting. And that's what really causes a lot of these children to flee. It has to do with this criminal violence. And we have a lot to do with this criminal violence. I've talked to more people who I'm realizing now think that there's so many drug cartels in Central America because they're all doing so much drugs. No. It's us. Yeah, it's the white lines. It's the white stuff we're putting up our nose. We talk more about our national drug problem when a movie star dies than we do when tens of thousands of refugees from the war against children, the war on drugs, arrive at our shores. Yeah. These are refugees. This is the calling of our time in terms of who we are as a nation. And I hope that we all can really, really fundamentally understand that the laws that we're looking at changing due to this crisis, and I think it's unfortunate in some respect that we're calling a crisis. Some people might be able to go down there and see there's a bit of order to what's happening, certainly now. I think when we use that term crisis, it opens a space for dramatic action. And it's, it's paved the way now for us to take action that I, I think fundamentally affects who we are as a nation, our character. You know, we have a lot of pride built into the fact that we're the beacon of hope and democracy in this world. We're very proud of the greatest generation who went to war, as we're told, not to defend our borders, not to defend our interests, but to preserve our principle. Principle, that you do not return vulnerable people to a place where they're going to be tortured and killed and persecuted. That's who we are, and that's what we're looking at losing. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's move it into a Q&A. So, I'm going to ask the first question, and then as I'm asking and, uh, and we're hearing a response, I would invite those of you who have a specific question to start working your way up to the microphone. As you can tell, we have the iceberg. You know, you see a little bit, but there is so much information right here that maybe you have heard for the first time. Um, so, my question, John, is... If I'm a volunteer in this group, in this audience, what can I do to help make a difference right now and maybe in the next week mm -hmm. or months? Mm -hmm. Sure. So we know who the kids are who are coming here to our community. So there is a group of kids, and they're coming to live here in San Antonio. We have to welcome them. 
So we are going to be working to try to engage with groups as you form in groups. I, I think you know, the most that you can, you can form groups and decide what you have to offer, the easier it's going to be to work with agencies like us who, who, who know who the, where the kids are, where they're going. I, I think you need to build relationships with schools. Um, and because we've got you know, hundreds of children in our community who are going to hit the school system here very soon. And I think we need to get information out there. We need to make sure that school counselors know who they can call if they encounter a child who's got this problem. I, I think that that's our first line of, of contact right now as a community. Maybe some members of the school system who are here, I'm so glad to have your voice, could, could speak to that. Anybody from San Antonio would like to speak? Yes, and, and I invite you to come up to the mic so we can all hear you. Oh, we can pass the mic. We can try we can, and pa can we pass the mic? Be like yes, we can. Be like Donahue. I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty loud. Can everybody hear me? No. no, 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 no. Oh. I'm like Donahue. Call her. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, John, for the, uh, for the presentation. My name is Marisa Perez. Again, I represent, I'm here representing San Antonio Independent School District in the Governmental and Community Relations Department. But in addition to that, I serve on the State Board of Education. And I represent the majority of San Antonio, and my area covers the Rio Grande Valley. So I split the Rio Grande Valley with another board member. And um, I guess my question for you, John, is what can we do as a state board of education to help support our districts um, with the influx of students? I know that these, student, these, these children are staying from anywhere from two weeks to several months. And so what can I do as a state board member to best prepare my districts right. for that? So they've got school systems. When they're in shelter care, they have to, just like any child in Texas, they have to go to school. And so Baptist and, and, and the Archdiocese, they have school, school districts that are affiliated, or the schools that are affiliated with the district inside the shelters. And they have a, a rotating curriculum that's not, that's not the full curriculum. It, takes into, it understands that the children are there for a short period of time. Um, the children who get out, who are going to the local high schools, or middle schools, they're going to be there for your full year. They're, they're not going to just be there for a matter of weeks. They're absolutely going to be there. You know, the average length of a case that we might take is 15 to 16 months from the point of apprehension to when we can get a kid their permanent residence. So um, obviously the, 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 the ESL classes and also understanding that a lot of children who are labeled as Spanish speakers are not Spanish speakers, particularly when if you see that they're from the nation of Guatemala. Do you capture country of origin? Is that something that's part of the intake process, country of origin? Uh, the Texas Education Agency has a list of that, but I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. the Texas Education Agency does um, capture the does keep track of that. Um, however, the issue with that is our students, are, are the children going to be in our system long enough for the Texas Education Agency to acquire all of that information? Uh, that's, that's they the will be in long enough, and in the aggregate, children from these countries with these needs are going to be uh, are going to be increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, present. So the numbers, they were originally expecting 40 to 60,000 children this year. They had to revise that number up. By this year, we're talking about the fiscal year that starts in October. Okay, so when we say this year on these numbers, we're talking about since October of 2013, in fact. Uh, they estimated 40 to 60,000. They had to uh, revise that to 90,000. And the numbers for next year are 140,000. I was just in D.C. and they're really talking like 200,000 next year. So this is the small summer. I, I think, um, speaking from San Antonio ISD also, I think that <laughs> these children are coming with a lot of issues, not only educational issues, but social and emotional issues uh, that need to be looked at. And um, given last year, we experienced about in the vicinity of less than 100 that we know of. There could have been more. Uh, we're planning to identify these children to see exactly where, where they're coming from and who they are so that we can understand the population themselves. Uh, because before we can say, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this other kind of stuff, from an educational perspective, we really need to know who they are. This way we can address their individualized attend needs, educational needs. Uh, from the onset, obviously, the social emotional side, they're going to have a lot of needs. Clothing and all that kind of stuff, school supplies, whatever. That's going to be a need. How many are actually coming to San Antonio is another issue. Here in Bear County, we've got over 17 different school districts. Where are they going to get housed? Where are they going to go to school? How many is going where and what? Things like that. So there's a lot of issues there. So I, I think, you know, from the, to get started for the fall, we just want to know who these kids are. We want to be able to identify them. 
and work with them and kind of have a self-assessment within ourselves as to where we go as to how to best address their academic needs. Okay, so. Great. Oops. And you're going to have children such as these who come from the shelters. You're going to have children who are, who are recent arrivals, who may or may not be unaccompanied, who didn't get apprehended, who never went through the system, so they won't have that label or tag, or they won't be going to court, so to speak. And, and then you've got also many children who are here in San Antonio who we call dreamers, who are also undocumented, but you just wouldn't know it. They've, they've grown up here. So um, they're all populations of, of undocumented students that we've got in our schools. They all have particular needs. We have a question here. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, my question is more for the audience than anybody else because I, I didn't realize there were going to be so many priests and ministers here today. Uh, but when we're collecting uh, for uh, donations and so forth, we, I've had a number of people come up to me and say, you know, uh, the other side of the fence, those who are against accepting the children here, uh, will come up and start giving them a hard time. And uh, the, since I'm running for public office, they will uh, say, what, what should I say to them? And, I, and my response has been, <coughs> This has absolutely nothing to do with politics. It has to do with children. It has to do with human caring. And, no. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, and, and my response has been when people came to me and said the same thing uh, and said, uh, asked me about it, I, my response has been, read your Bible. <laughs> and, and that worked. I had one fellow who said, well, I'm an atheist. And my response was, you really need to read your Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to know, other than in, in essentially trying to cut them off because there's no talking with them, what is a better response to say to someone like that? I mean, the U.S. The US Conference of Catholic Bishops is clear. Faith leaders and church leaders around the country are clear. The position of, of, of every faith is clearly on the side of the immigrant and, and welcoming the stranger. Uh, our, our Bible is full of stories of, of migration. Every great character from Jesus to Moses is a migrant. And, and clearly what we're seeing here is on the level of things we've read about in the Bible. And we can only hope that our response meets that challenge as well. I think once people hear individual stories like you have told and, and are circulating, we, uh, we we be, become connected with the human story, and I think that's the answer. I wanted to comment real quick on something you said about collecting things, because I think we, uh, some of us got, and many of you probably got this too, some important information that there is not a need for items to be collected for the valley at this point. They are at capacity, and the, the need is gonna be, as we're hearing, long-term issues, school issues, legal support, some foster homes, mentoring, uh, mentoring uh, trauma care, uh, those kinds of things. So when, when uh, at, at this point, it doesn't seem like, and the kids who are in the shelters are provided for physically uh, very well. So that, um, that desire, that impulse to uh, give clothes and shoes and so forth, at this point we need to, to hold back on. Well, I, I don't have anything to add. It's just that we have a relatively short time before we've agreed that we're going to adjourn. And I think we need to focus on where we go from here. Yeah. Where we go from here, picking up on uh, mentoring, it seems to me that uh, one possibility would be for if people wanted to volunteer to be mentors, that uh, you might be the contact person uh, with whom we could get in touch with individual yeah. children. So there's an email address that we have set up at RIASIS. We have somebody manning it, um, and I could give that to you if you're interested. It's help kids, help kids, one word. At riasistexas.org. I'll spell that. It's R A I C like Charlie, E like Echo, S like Sierra, Texas, all spelled out, T E X A S dot O R G. Are we on the list? Oh, great, great. So help kids. We're on the agenda. Is that the agenda? Is that email address on there? But the Riasis Texas is there. Help kids at Riasis Texas. Send an email. State what you want to provide. 
and we will get in touch with you. This is a long-term issue, folks. This is going to be a long-term issue. And so we hope that you can have the patience to stay with us as we stick with this issue over the long term. Um, it's going to be uh, a, a while as we get to reconnoiter these children who have been released and we get to meet with them and we will put them in touch, but it's critical that they get mentors to help them. So once again, if you have not uh, signed up yet on the sign-up sheet, I invite you to do that and get your email address and then we will email after this. We've been taking notes and so there will be a brief <laughs> set of minutes of what's transpired with everyone who has been here and on the email address, so we're going to share the full email list mm -hmm. of everyone who attended with everyone who is here and that we have an email address. And so you will capture his email address and be able to direct. I think we've got questions, questions in the back. Yes, yeah, so I just have one question specifically for the San Antonio ISD. I don't know if you're aware of this, but San Francisco and a lot of schools in the country are adopting um, a way for children to uh, respond to trauma um, and also children who haven't experienced trauma to focus, and it's called mindfulness. I don't know if you've heard of this, but there are schools who are adopting policies in their um, schools, and it's, and it's called mindful um, kind of time. They call it mindful time or quiet time, and that's something that we might want to consider <laughs> for the immediate response for children who are in classrooms that have dealt with trauma. Um, it's just something I wanted to raise to your attention. I'd love to speak with someone who's part of the ISD, so thank you. So then I'm going to invite you to pass the mic to our guest from HSH. There she is. She's jotting down a note. We'd love, thank you for being here, and we'd love, I'm sure you have something to say or comment. I'm just very touched by this. One of the things that I, I've been trying to convey to people is that the, the people who are negative and against the children and don't want to help them are the ones who dominate the news coverage. And we know from the calls that we get every day at HHS that you are the majority. And, you, and so many Americans have just been so welcoming uh, to these children and want to help them. So I just thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I've been with the kids for the last few days here. Uh, their stories, you know, what the, the one woman said about sharing personal stories, that's the most moving thing. And it's just incredible what these children have been through to get here and their incredible vulnerabilities. And we are able to match them mostly with families. and. Those who have family in the United States are actually more vulnerable to violence and to kidnapping and being taken hostage because they think they can get the money from the states. So we do end up, I think 55% of our kids end up with a parent, and that's not an accident. Those things are connected. Um, so these children are targets for violence, and uh, we need to do everything we can to protect them, and thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, the other guest that I'd like to really hear from was BCFS, and I think you were down here maybe. Did you have anything to add? From, I know that uh, the sheltering mission, a lot of folks wanted to hear a little bit about it, and I know I'm putting you on the spot. Would you like to stand up and speak a little bit about BCFS? Well, the, the sheltering mission has been done since the rise in the number of um, uh, immigrant children have happened late this spring and through this summer. Those numbers of children presenting to the border have dropped considerably and we're looking at um, the shelters being closed over the next few weeks. But we're all concerned about the long-term uh, uh, care for these children, what happens to them legally, what happens to them in school. And I think Mr. Ryan did a great job of um, helping understand that um, these children um, don't, didn't just need that care um, during that first month or so that they're here in the U.S., but they have long-term needs that um, are going to need to be met. And um, there needs to be some continuity of care. Um, I was happy to hear that um, there will be services since um, continued through the, the legal system for these kids because the majority of them, although a lot stay in Texas, are going to Minnesota and Maine and California and Oregon and Florida. They're, they're going to need care in, in, for years to come in a lot of places. I was surprised that only 63% are going to get refugee status. Um, I thought it was higher than that from the personal stories and the experiences that I've had. Um, they're, you know, very sad, but most of them are 
are relieved to be here um, after they go through the situation at the border that he mentioned. Um, they are hopeful and um, excited about getting with a close family member or a distant family member or another sponsor. So, right. and thank you for what you do. Okay. If there's enough, if there's enough already on the border, what do we need to be doing now to help? Them? Question. What do we need to be doing now to help children? I, 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 think, I think for those children who are here in this community, immediately groups of people who can provide mentorship. I think also we've got other issues as well. And I, I think that there are other immigrants, there are other people in this community. We work with the Lutherans, Lutheran Immigrant Refugee Services funds us to work with detained survivors of torture. We're working with a shelter on the west side that houses African women who are pregnant, who the Border Patrol, when they get pregnant African ladies, they call us on our cell phone and we bring them up here. There are people to be worked with in that community. Um, there are adults, there are family units who are gonna get dumped at Greyhound. We need people who are willing to maybe do a reception teams at the Greyhound stations. We need people who wanna mentor young people. Um, uh, you, need, you, you need to come forward, let us know your language abilities, let us know your interests, and we'll find a way to get you helping. I've got Andrew Solano who's come and visiting us. Uh, he represents our Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I just briefly wanted to just mention um, the congressman couldn't be here today, but I wanted to make sure I, I attended the meeting. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that uh, so many of you came out. Uh, I wish it was under different circumstances, but uh, our, our office works closely with Jonathan and his group. Uh, many of you in the audience know our office and the congressman. Uh, we want to continue to ask you to call our office. Uh, we're, we're happy to point you in the right direction if we can. Um, we've continued to monitor the situation. It's at the forefront of what our office is doing. Uh, I did have the opportunity to tour the Lackman facility uh, a few months ago um, and, and report back to the congressman. Uh, our district, if, you, if you're not aware, is from Austin down to San Antonio. Um, and so we don't have any parts of the border. Uh, but absolutely, you know, again, this is at the forefront of our legislative issues. Um, you know, some of the, 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 the politics out, out of it, um, you know, we had the Humane Act recently. And, and uh, you know, Congressman Doggett did not feel that that was the right uh, piece of legislation moving forward. Uh, we don't think that we should be rolling back any of the, um, any of the uh, opportunities that we have and protections for these kids who are coming over because at the end of the day, it is an immigration uh, issue, but it's also humanitarian. And we want to make sure that what we're not seeing is, is the first thing that they see across the border is, is some militia with a gun pointed at them. Uh, we want to make sure that it's, it's someone um, who, who are, who's there to, to care for the children like Jonathan and, and his agency, uh, his organization. And we're just asking for a little you know, humanity and decency for the kids. Mm -hmm. And so we want to continue to monitor the situation. Um, uh, I have my card there. I signed my email up. So if you ever Good. need to get a hold of us, our office is here on 217 West Travis. Uh, we do represent the downtown area. So this is in our district. So I wanted to come by and say hello. And if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to contact me. And you're going to stick around a little bit longer. And so some of the folks Absolutely. after we break up will be able to visit with yes. you. And Thank you might you be able to much. correct me, but I think it's an important number to know. 202-224-3121. Is that, is that correct? Sorry. For the switchboard, for the congressional switchboard, I believe is 202-224-3121. That's the congressional switchboard. The numbers, uh, the reports we hear is that the phones are ringing off the hook against the kids, uh, 10 to 1. And that's the currency of Washington is those phone calls. A, new, a phone call every 24 hours is a new unique phone call. If you don't want to talk to anybody, you can leave a message at night and it still gets counted, letting them know that you support these refugee children. A new call every 24 hours is a new unique call and 10 to 1 right now uh, anti-immigrant calls. So I'm looking at the clock. I do have one question here and then I think it would be appropriate before we dismiss uh, in prayer, and we will do that in just a minute, to, uh, to talk about when this group uh, would like to get back together again, if, if we're going to do that. And so, question? I just wanted to answer the question of what can we do now. My name is Cursita McLean. I'm the Education Minister at Laurel Heights. I'm also the United Methodist Children's Advocacy Person. Um, these kids have been with us for years. I mean, I'm, and, and those of us who've been beating drums for kids for years are thrilled that everyone cares. One of the things I say to people is, well, first of all, socks and underwear never go to waste, okay? So if people just wanna give you something, 
tell them to give you socks and underwear. They just, they never go to waste. But the second, you know it's true. And That's the only reason you're laughing. Okay. Um, and one sock really never goes to waste, right? Um, but most of what I want to say to you is there are many, many organizations who are set up. They are on the front lines. They are doing this work daily. That's the reason why these children have been cared for before the media hit it in June. If you have people in your congregations, in your organizations who are moved, Tell them to do something. Go register at CASA and become a CASA. Go become a foster parent. In Bear County currently, we have, and I wish Yolanda was still here to back me up, but two weeks ago, we had not one foster home left in Bear County that could accept a family of more than three kids. Most of these kids come in three to five family systems. So what I would say to tell you is to use all of this passion and all of this emotion to continue to work for children all you have to do is go online and put I want to volunteer for kids and just watch the list show up and then figure out if you want to read go contact SA Reads and read to a kid for an hour a week if you want to be a foster parent and you want to feed them dinner be a foster parent if you want to go work in the court system go to CASA go through the training and go fight I mean all of these organizations have been here and friends they're going to be here for a long time because this type of movement allows us to motivate more people to the needs that all kids have. And these are not organizations that say, oh, are you legal? Well, then I'll help you, okay? So just encourage people to do something and if they want to do something other than give money and all the organizations that you've talked, they're looking for 10 more dollars, especially Raises who bless your hearts, I don't even want to know what your balance sheet looks like right now, okay? But the money helps, but if they have to give something, just collect socks and underwear and we'll see that some child gets new socks and underwear. Great, thank you. Okay, so quick show of hands for those of you who are interested in, in having another gathering. A progress report. Mm -hmm. a prog an update, mm -hmm. progress report? Would we, you be available? Yeah, to we also have to maintain, that? I think, situational readiness and awareness because we are experiencing a lull and it's going to leave the headlines. And people are going to forget about this a little bit for a while, and it's going to rear its head again. And so we have to maintain the momentum. As I say, we kind of have to maintain that August 1st readiness that we arrived at over the summer. It was a long, hard summer to get to where we got in August 1st, where we felt like we had resources and ability. We can't let that deteriorate over the next four or five months, because uh, come February, March, we're going to be right back here in high numbers again, if not sooner. <laughs>